Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, from your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today, I'm really pumped up. And it's not just because I'm wired on caffeine. I am joined by a guy that he's kind of a big deal now, and he's not doing land. And he has nothing to sell except just help people. This guy is really phenomenal and really paying it forward. Kevin Bupp. Let me explain Kevin Bupp to you. He's been investing in real estate for 15 years. He started when he was 19 in college. He started out in single family homes, progressed into commercial. He's a true entrepreneur at heart. He's owned other numerous businesses in industries other than real estate, which I'm going to grill him about. Uh, he's very involved in multiple local charities. I told you he pays it forward. He's the host of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, which is a phenomenal resource. And he put this in his bio, which I thought was really sweet. Married to the most incredible lady and has an 11-month-old son. Land Geek Nation, please welcome Kevin Bupp. Kevin, how are you? I'm doing awesome, Mark. Thanks for having me on the show today. I'm real excited to be here. I'm psyched you're here, man. So let's just get right into it. Let's, let's not even do any fluff. What, how'd you get into real estate? What, what made you start investing in, in college? I mean, you're really young. Well, I can tell you that I had absolutely no direction in life when I was 19 years old before I started investing in real estate. And, uh, I got lucky. I really did. Um, I was just taking general college courses. Uh, in fact, I didn't even go away to a university. I went to a community college because I didn't want to waste my parents' money because um, I just I wasn't ready for life yet. Or I, was, I didn't really know what direction I wanted to go. But um, I started dating a girl, and uh, her her mother had just been through a divorce, and she started dating a guy. Um, became friends with him. I saw him around the house during the day a lot when I was, you know, obviously in between classes, and just really wondered what the heck he was doing. Shouldn't he be at a nine to five, or you know, shouldn't he have a job? And chatted with him one day, found out that he was a real estate investor, owned some uh, single-family rentals and, and multifamily apartment buildings in, in the city I lived in. And uh, just it was very intriguing to me that he had the lifestyle where he literally on a Wednesday afternoon, he was hanging out watching movies or you know just hanging out in his home office. So um, it just it, it, it piqued my interest, and I, I grilled him about it for a few months. And once he realized that I actually, you know, that I was kind of digging for more and more information, um, you know, we became friends along that period of time. And uh, he actually in invited me to a Ron LeGrand boot camp in Philadelphia. It's like a three-day boot camp. And uh, for those of you that don't know who Ron LeGrand is, he's kind of one of the old-school gurus that, you know, d does a whole bunch of sales pitches and, uh, you know, sells you on how to wholesale houses and, you know, rehab and flip houses. But anyway, so I went to this thing with him, was super excited, didn't know what the heck I was getting myself into. I think I tried to read a couple of real estate books before I went, but it was just over my head. You know, it was, it was all brand new to me. Sure. I, was a bar, I was a bartender. I mean, I was a bartender and I was going to community college. So um, went to this boot camp, three days. And um, after the first day, it just, I, I got it. Like it just, it made sense to me. And, you know, things were going in my brain and uh, they were making sense. And I started looking around the room, started, you know, hearing some testimonials from people that were in the class that were actively investing. And some of them didn't seem so bright. So I was like, gosh, man, these guys aren't, these, a lot of these people aren't very, they don't look sharp to me. They don't look any smarter than what I am. Sure. So they can, if they can do it, I can do it. I mean, so I, I went home with that attitude. I was super pumped up and gun ho, like, like most people are when they leave one of those boot camps, you know, rah, rah, rah. And, uh, this, started hitting the ground running and felt like my wheels were spinning a little bit. And uh, David, who, who's the gentleman that took me to this boot camp, he um, he kind of let me fumble around a little bit for about a month before he looked at me and said, you know what, Like, I wanted you to fumble around for a month, but you really need a mentor. That's the only way you'll ever be successful in life in general um, is if you have a mentor to kind of show you the rope. So he's like, what I'll offer to you is – if you want to follow me around for six months, that means come to my meetings with me, You know, talk to realtors, go look at houses, look at the projects I'm working on, collect rent from tenants. You can follow me around in between your classes, You know, whenever you have free time, just spend it with me. So I actually took, um, I took the next semester off school and uh, literally went to his house every day, pretty much every day during the week, and sat in his office with him and became really close friends, listened to him on the phone. 
listen to the deals he was doing, have him explain to me why he was doing what he was doing, um, and just really learn the business inside and out, watch him how he interacted with uh, with sellers, how he interacted with buyers, real estate agents, brokers, things like that. And uh, I guess it took about a, about a year um, before I was ready to do my first deal. I mean, probably a little bit less than that. And so um, you're 20 years old doing your first. Tw- deal. Yeah, yeah, 20 years old. I um I put a there was a, a, a you know a bunch of row like inner city Harrisburg where I grew up in Pennsylvania um, wasn't a really nice area. In fact, there's still some really rough areas there now. But the area where I bought my first house. It was a uh, it was a bank owned property. It was a um, dilapidated row home. I think it was built in like the nineteen forties. I mean, I didn't know what the heck I was doing, but I knew I knew how to figure out what the after repaired value was, is based on you know the classes I had taken and also you know the information David gave me, and uh, so I figured out, out the after repaired value, um, made a low ball offer on it, and it was accepted. Um, I think I paid twenty nine, actually twenty six thousand dollars for the house. It was worth, um, you know, probably like sixty-five or so. Um, now, Tevin, put, where, where'd you get the money? You're twenty actually, years old. Yeah, actually, I had some of my own money. I had about five or six grand that I had saved up. I actually made really good money bartending uh, the job I had, but uh, obviously, I didn't have enough money to pay cash for this thing. Sure. And that's where that's where David came into play. Um, he had a lot of relationships with private investors and private lenders, and um, he introduced me to one of his private lenders. And uh, I ran him through the deal, told him what I was going to do with it, told him what my intentions were. He knew obviously David had my back in terms of um, you know coaching me through the process if I hit any road bumps. And uh, I borrowed, I guess I borrowed 21000 or actually, no, I, I guess I borrowed about thirty. I don't remember all these numbers. This is so long ago. Sure. I think I borrowed about thirty grand from them, put, you know, put 5000 or 6000 whatever I had you know, as my own skin into the game, and uh, turned around and sold that property for $59,000, uh, I think probably about, you know, four or five months, uh, you know, later. After, it took us about two months to rehab it, and then it sat on the market for a few months before it had a good qualified buyer. So... Um, you know, walked away with, uh, you know, 20 or so thousand dollars in my pocket, which was about what I was making, uh, working as a part-time bartender and, sure. um, you know, going to school. And, you know, that just, that got me super excited. I mean, that, that, the level of confidence that gave me after I did my first deal was just, I can't even describe it in words. I mean, it just, it, it put this, it instilled me with this confidence that no one could take away. No one could strip this away from me. And I was like, you know what? I did it once. And it didn't seem that hard. And I, I made some mistakes. I probably spent some more mo- more money than what I should have on the rehab. But I'm going to do this again. So anyway, we did some more deals in Pennsylvania. I partnered on some stuff with David. Um, continued going to school and actually finished my you know my four year degree at the local community college. And um, decided I wanted to get into real estate full time. But I didn't want to stay in Pennsylvania. So um, just not enough action there for me. Just it's a town that really doesn't progress. <laughs> you know, in <laughs> sure. fact, when I when I go back now, the people I knew 15 years ago are still doing what they were doing when I left. I mean, literally going to the same places, you know, hanging out with the same people. And, you know, just it doesn't doesn't it hasn't evolved that much. But which isn't a bad thing, but not for me. So I moved to Florida um, back in uh, I guess 2002, and um, you know, just really took took some time down here to get involved in real estate. Um, you know, started learning the market, you know, what was happening, who the players were, attended a whole bunch of real estate investment club meetings, um, and just, you know, dove in feet first and uh, started doing deals, I guess, six to eight months after I, I was living here and, um, you know, f- focused primarily on single family homes. Okay. I was, and I was so what, what was like your sweet spot? I mean, were you looking at, at the low, lower low, end of the market? Yeah. Yeah. End? yeah we were low. In, I was low income. T- I mean, I, I basically did what was my comfort zone. So I was looking at lower end type stuff, which is similar to what I was doing in Pennsylvania. Um, so, you know, first time home buyer stuff, stuff that was priced under $100,000. Big um, gold? Um, both. Uh, we, we, you know, we did a lot of marketing. You know, we made, we made a lot of offers through realtors on bank owned property. We made a lot of offers through realtors on properties that were just privately owned. And then we did a whole bunch of other uh, outside marketing, you know, like we did, you know, banded signs, like we buy houses, we did direct mail campaigns, um, you know, networked at investor meetings. I bought a lot of properties uh, from wholesalers that were flipping them. Uh Um, So every which way you could think of, we bought deals, Uh, you know, just you have, you have to, you know, put a whole bunch of tentacles out there in order to fill your pipeline on a regular basis. So I did whatever I could do to, uh, to fill our pipeline. And, and started doing a lot of deals. Actually, I um, I guess within a few years, um, had done twenty or thirty homes, and then I partnered up with a group and based out of Sarasota, Florida, which is about an hour south of where I was living in Tampa. And this group was huge. Um, they had they had bought and sold about six hundred single family homes in Denver, Colorado, before they came to Florida. 
Um, they came to Florida, in, I think, 2000, and um, became really good friends with them. I bought some property from them. Uh, we did some deals together and just really uh, built a relationship. It was two brothers and their family and um, started partnering with them on deals. They, they At the time, they had owned about 300 single-family homes uh, in Florida on the West Coast. Wow. And um, I started buying with them. We started partnering on deals. And I ended now, up were, doing, they, were they flipping or doing tenants or um, combination? 90% of it was long-term hold strategy. Okay. Um, you know, we would sell deals when we needed to um, just to, you know, build up more capital reserves. But uh, primarily it was just buying them, you know, for, you know, most of the time, we, we had a really strict rule of thumb. We never pay more than 65 cents on the dollar, you know, with all repairs and everything like that factored in. So wow. we, always, we always had a big, you know, buffer zone there. And um, throughout a period of a few years, uh, we end up, I ended up acquiring my own portfolio over 100 single-family homes, along with some multifamily properties as well. You know, I've, I've had, uh, you know, a bunch of duplexes and fourplexes and, you know, 12 units. I think I had a 24-unit, an 18-unit. I think the biggest one I had was... Uh, was like a we had a 76 unit so nothing really bigger than that in terms of multifamily. but um so we were, but we were primarily single family home guys that, that was what that was our comfort zone that's what got us excited and we were just buying them like crazy like hotcakes sure and then uh and then 2007 2008 hit <laughs> and uh <laughs> And, um, I and mean, just, Florida got hit so hard. I mean, the music stopped. Even though yeah. we bought these things right, it wasn't just the, um, the values that got crushed down here. Um, the rental market got crushed. And, and what I mean by that is there was a ton of speculative builders that were building um, these homes in, in, in areas that were only supported really by the real estate market. I mean, you got construction workers, title agents, realtors. And, I mean, they were literally building for that market only. I mean, that, that's, that's what they're in. They were intending those people on buying them or investors out of state flipping them. It was just like a, this is hot potato. You know, whoever gets stuck with it is, you know, you know, shame on you type thing. But so what happened is these developers that were building these spec homes, they started renting them out for less than what we were renting our 25 and 30 year old homes for. And, you know, with single family homes, I mean, if you're cash flowing 250 bucks a month, I mean, that's a lot of people say that's great, but that, that's, Number one, it's difficult because two hundred fifty dollars a month um, that gets eaten up very quickly if you have any turnover. Let's so, so if you have a tenant that leaves after twelve months, if you need to clean carpets, or replace carpets, paint, do some drywall work, minor things, that cash flow gets eaten up very quickly. But number two, a speculative builder start renting new homes for less than what you're renting yours for. That means you got to drop your rate. So sure, it, very quickly um, we st- we basically went from a cash flow standpoint. To a negative cash flow standpoint, to where we were basically funding our own demise. <laughs> and, well, how, uh, how did you handle that, Kevin? I mean, how did you pivot? You know, so we, we when we realized what the market was doing, I mean, it happened so quick. Even, I mean, I say that I was new. I mean, I was new. At, I, you could say I was new. I've only been investing for you know five, six years. Yeah, so um, you'd never been through a full real estate yeah, cycle. But the guys I was investing with had been through multiple cycles. These guys were like twenty years my senior, and uh, and there's a lot guy, a lot of guys that were way smarter than I was that were getting hit as well. Um, so I just think it hit so much faster than anyone anticipated. And we started trying to fire sale our properties. I mean, we like marked them down to like eighty percent, and then like you know a month later seventy percent, and we were selling some. But I mean, it was crashing faster than us lowering them ten percent per month. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And um, so it got to the point where we were like, well, shit, I mean, we're, uh, we're in a bad position. You know, what do we do? And um, it's either we take the money that we have, you know, we all had our own savings and things like that. We either keep feeding this animal, um, which was massive checks each month to make up for the, uh, the negative cash flow, or we just, you know, make the executive decision to, to let the ones go that are killing us. And that was a big portion of our properties. And um, ended up giving um, me personally ended up giving uh, about ninety percent of my at least my single family homes back to the banks. Um, yeah. It just there was no way to salvage it. I mean, and I'm glad I di- I'm glad I made the the split decision to do it. We didn't wait for a year. We didn't wait for you know eighteen months. I mean, we made that decision within probably about seven or eight months of things going very bad. And um, I'm glad I did because it obviously didn't turn around quick at all. Um, and uh, I would have been br- I would have been completely broke. If I would have waited uh, in a very short period of time, I would have been completely broke, savings wiped out, and I would have been in a really rough position. So, um, obviously, I was, it was pretty bad because my credit was just completely smashed, and um, obviously, it was in a lot of um, legal suits with you know banks. And, and as of today, I literally only have one property that's still in default, and it's only because Bank of America just can't keep their can't get their crap together. I've been trying <laughs> yeah. to give this property back to them, but anyway, so. Um, 
what I did is, uh, it, it was it was very damaging to my ego, and uh, you know, this come two thousand, you know, mid mid two thousand eight, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I know that I didn't. I was I was kind of I was over real estate at that point in time. I mean, the market was sterile. you know, you know, uh, saying, "Oh, how this is so bad, terrible. We lost everything we own," and, and you get stuck in your local bubble. And, and Florida was really bad, so all I heard was negativity coming from every angle. All my friends that were investors were all losing money, and it's just kind of like, "Oh, the world's going to end." Right. So the, the last thing I wanted to think about was uh, investing in real estate and you know putting my money into another losing proposition. So um, took a little bit of time, you know, self time to focus, and you know, spend some time with my wife and. Just try to think of what our next step in life would be, and um, we're big runners. We're very into fitness. We do a ton of cycling. We actually have a bunch of charity events that we host, uh, running charity events, and uh, so we had an idea when we were running Chicago Marathon. Um, I think it was 2008 Chicago Marathon, and um, had an idea for a a printing company. It was kind of like a novelty printing company. I knew nothing about printing. I didn't know about business, but I didn't know anything about the printing world. It was like wide format printing, and didn't know anything about apparel or anything like that, and. Uh, Spent a couple of months, uh, hired a team of virtual assistants in the Philippines, um, you know, built a team of web designers, graphic designers, and um, learned about the printing business, bought some printing equipment, and, and started the website. I wanted to do something that I enjoyed in terms of I wanted to do something that I had a passion, or at least that was attached to a passion I had, and running was a passion of mine. Sure. So um, anyway, did that, and uh, still have that business today. Um, it's still, we call it our ATM machine because we don't put a lot of effort into it, but it, it, uh, it, it runs itself basically and uh, gives us cash each, each month. But um, I got sick of that after about two years and realized that I, I wasn't, I didn't have the passion to build it into something big. Um, so it's a, still a small business. We have like five employees. And uh, so I wanted to get back into real estate and took a dive back in. Uh, I guess it's what's today? So probably 2011. I made the decision that I really wanted to get back in, but I I, I I took my time and I really did some research and did some soul searching as to what happened in 2008 and how that wasn't going to happen again to me. And sure. uh, the only thing I looked at that w- that was factual data that um, that I could support my decisions on was the fact that our multifamily properties were the only things that survived this whole crash in 2008 and I, and I thought to myself why the heck didn't I just put more focus on those because they can they survived the storm I mean they just they they had um, they kind of had a, a, a buffer built into them I mean you've got uh, less management intensive uh, property you got multiple units underneath one roof it just made sense to me um, so I decided that I was only going to buy multifamily properties and then I started looking at the different you know types of properties. Now, when you say multifamily, are you are you looking at duplexes? Are you looking at yeah. apartment well, buildings? Well, I wanted to do bigger deals. I mean, I was you know it's really hard to build. Um, it's really hard to build a ton of wealth on doing small deals like that. I mean, to, sure. I, I want I wanted to only invest for passive passive cash flow, and I, I considered at that point in time appreciation is funny money. Appreciation is not necessarily spendable. It's look at it as monopoly money. So I didn't want to look at the monopoly money side of things. I only wanted to buy properties that were had passive uh, cash flow opportunities. And if they appreciated, if I could force the you know force the equity in them, then that would be icing on the cake. But I wanted deals that cash flowed from day one and had the ability to support themselves. So this meant it had to be bigger properties. Typically. Uh, what that means, at least from a um, an apartment standpoint, that's like you know twenty four units plus in size, and we like mobile home parks, and we look at deals that are basically forty units plus in size. That's kind of our niche, um, and uh, I was attracted to mobile home parks for multiple different reasons. They've got some very unique barriers to entry um, for the particular asset class, uh, whereas you know there's no one, there's no new mobile home parks being built in the U.S. They're only going away because the developers are, you know, tearing them down and building malls or shopping centers or retail centers, whatever it may be. Right. And no, no, no local municip- municipalities or governments like them, so they yeah. don't issue they don't issue permits for them to be built. So yeah, I, I never knew how how uh, big that market was either. I mean, it's a big market. Yeah, it's very competitive now. It, it wasn't probably ten years ago, but um, there's a lot of. Um, uh, there's there's some really big uh, REITs that are involved in this space, and uh, there's some recent articles that were written by uh, Wall Street Journal, um, New York Times, and um, I think there's there's another big um, I think maybe it was Forbes actually had articles where they just touted the the benefits or the you know the investment benefits of owning mobile home parks in terms of I think one of them was labeled like you know double digit returns via mobile home parks or something like that right and uh, that that grabs a lot of uh, that grabs a lot of attention from from investors that are looking for you know a good place to put their money so. 
Um, but either way, so we, we, you know, back 2011, we started focusing on mobile home parks. That's all we do today. Um, that's literally what we put 100% of our energy into are buying mobile home parks in, I guess, about 20 different markets throughout the U.S., primarily on the East Coast here. And um, Now, when you say we, tell, tell me about your team. Well, it's uh, my partnership is primarily like the principals of our company are, are there's two individuals. It's myself and another business partner. Um, he's a, he's I guess about 20 years my senior. Uh, he's a CCIM guy, so he's, he's I say he's more sophisticated than I am, but he's like our he's our numbers guy on the team. He loves spreadsheets. I get him all excited, and and uh, he loves evaluating properties. And I'm I'm more of the marketing side. I'm really good at finding deals. I'm really good at building systems. Um, you know, getting deals, filling the pipeline. And then we've got a bunch of other guys. We've got a full time researcher that. All he does is build our database out. He does research on properties and the markets we're looking. Um, you know, he digs up uh, you know contact information for property owners, phone numbers, mailing addresses. Um, he helps us manage our direct mail campaign and our cold calling campaign. Um, then we've got a guy that all he does full times is picks up the phone and cold calls. Um, then we got we got an admin person as well that kind of helps pull all the pieces together. So we're a small team. We're not huge. Uh, we've got five people that uh, that are on our team. Um, you know, we've got a couple other investors that we partner with on deals here and there, um, guys that are, um, they've been in the business a little bit longer than us. Uh, they've done a lot more deals in the mobile home park space. So if there's a deal that we can't take down on our own, we've got a few guys that we kind of, uh, we team up with to, to make those deals happen. Guys that are a little bit more advanced in their knowledge of uh, the mobile home park space. So, but just five of us, that's our primary team and uh, we do pretty well with it. That's fantastic. So t- tell me, yeah. you know, when did you make the transition from full-time investor and you've got your your printing business and say, you know what, I want to just help people learn about what I'm doing and started the podcast? Yeah, so I've been wanting the podcast for um, for a long time, and, and my my initial intention with podcasting was to have a, a mobile home park specific podcast. Back when I decided that's what we wanted to invest in, but. What I found was it would I found it would, it would have been very difficult for me to talk about mobile home parks on a weekly basis and have really good new engaging content. So I thought that it would be more relevant to uh, come up with something that was more geared towards commercial real estate investing and building a uh, passive income portfolio via commercial real estate. So I've been wanting to do it for a while. Um, I actually bought the equipment. Um, back in 2011 and it sat around for like a year. I mean, you know, you get busy with life, you get busy with your business. Sure. And, um, my wife actually, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. I bought it in 2012 and my wife, <laughs> she, she came to me one day. She said, what the heck are you going to do with that equipment? You built a studio. I literally built a studio. I mean, I put all the sound stuff <laughs> up and bought the equipment. I mean, I kind of, I jumped the gun with a lot of stuff. That's just my nature. That's me. The new, you know, shiny new objects. Sure. And, uh, <laughs> I, she was like, what are you going to do with that? Either sell it or, or, or start this podcast. I'm like, you know what? That's a jump start I needed. I, I, I needed that kick in the butt. So I vowed to myself that, you know, come the 1st of 2014, I, I just set a date. I said, I'm going to have it launched. The first episode is going to be live. Um, you know, I think it was the 6th of January. The so first who, one who was your first guest? Um, Frank Rolf, who is uh, now, he's a he's the sixth largest private owner of mobile home parks in the U.S. I think he owns... Uh, I don't know how many parks he owns, but I know he owns about 13,000 spaces. Wow. So and I, I think that equates to, I think he's got somewhere around like, you know, 110 parks. I mean, just big deal. The guy, and the guy actually, uh, I met him about three years ago. And at that point, he only had 6,000 spaces. So, I mean, he, him and, and he's private. I mean, it's just him and another guy. Obviously, they have a team, but um, he just went on a buying spree when the, uh, when the real estate market crashed. Um, he's, he was cleaning up in the past couple of years on uh, bank owned REOs uh, that were mobile home parks and they're just kicking butt. So he was my first interview. Um, and who's, then, who's uh, been your favorite interview so far? Hmm. Favorite interview. That's a good question. You know, I brought uh, Frank Gallinelli on the show. I don't know if you, if you yeah, know who that I know is. That name. He, from Bigger Pockets, right? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't, I actually, I didn't know him. I wasn't even a member of Bigger Pockets uh, w- when I interviewed Frank. I, I became a big, Bigger Pockets member, I guess, probably about three or four months ago. But I, one of the first books I bought um, when I decided to get into the commercial side of the business was uh, What Every Real Estate Investor Needs to Know About Cash Flow. And it's a book that it, it changed my life in that it really opened up my eyes to um, you know properly how to evaluate income producing properties. And uh, it just really it had the formulas of success. I mean, that every real estate investor should know if they're going to be buying property, 
you know, to create passive wealth and income stream. So sure. I, it's just, it's an incredible book. It's very readable. It's, it's easy to comprehend even for someone that's uh, brand new to the business. And, um, he's a very sharp guy. I mean, he's just a wealth of knowledge and he was a lot of fun to have on the show. In fact, that was one of the most downloaded shows that we've had as well. People just, you know, ate it up. So he was a lot of fun and I've had a ton of other fun guests as well. I mean, it just, it's all across the board. I mean, I've had guys on that were, you know, IRA guys, 1031 guys, you know, apartment, you know, investors that own, you know, massive, you know, hundred million dollar plus portfolios. Um, it's just, Every, every show is different. Every guest is, uh, has been awesome, and uh, I love it. I actually I absolutely love the podcasting business, and, uh, and I love giving back. I mean, that's, that's really the reason why I, I do it. I don't really gain any benefit other than the relationships. I get to meet some awesome people, and I love to give back, and I love help people out. So, Yeah, I mean, that's, it's pretty unique because usually when people come on a podcast, they're usually like, okay, you know, I'm selling this, and let's mm-hmm. talk about you know, this. And you don't have that. Is that no, right? No, I don't have that. In fact, what I started doing, like, I guess it's been about three months now, is I started actually offering a 30 minute free consultation with me. And I, I normally have about 10 people or a dozen people a week that take advantage of it. I give them a link to my calendar and they can pick, you know, a time that I'm available via my calendar. And I get on the phone and chat with them. You know, some of these people are brand new. They're trying to get a, their feet into the business and need a little bit of direction. Some of them have done deals and they're trying to transition into, you know, a, a commercial asset class and they want some feedback or some of these guys are more advanced than I am and they just want to talk shop. So, huh. um, yeah, so th- that's been awesome. And I say, I tell, I tell my, my wife this all the time that this podcast has made me a smarter investor. So that's the benefit I get out of it. It's made me smarter and I get to help others, you know, that are coming up in, in this business. So it's yeah, a lot of fun. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, expanding your network, there's only positive benefits to it. And I get, yeah, absolutely. I get to meet people like you. I didn't know anything about land investing. Now, now you got me all excited. You're, you're the new shiny object in my life that I need to learn about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kevin's going to be at the, at the uh, two day land geek boot camp in November. Yeah, I'm going to get him out there. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if I showed up there. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, th- this is the time on the podcast where I like to put you on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week. Now, that, that book was a great tip, but. Do you have another tip you want to share? I do. It's a, it's a resource that I actually came across about two or three months ago, and um, it's made our, our, our cold calling campaigns, uh, the accuracy of them, it's, it, which used to be about 75% of you know phone calls we would connect with or phone numbers that were accurate that we'd be able to find online, it's increased that to about 98 to 99% accuracy. And it's a, it's a resource that allows you to easily track down cell phone numbers for property owners. Wow. It's called it's called T L O dot com. That's Tom Larry Orange dot com. T L O dot com. I'm yep. I'm gonna check out that site. Yeah, and, it will uh, it will blow your mind. If if you don't mind, if uh if you're in this business and uh and, and you're thinking about doing like a cold calling campaign, um do not do it unless you actually utilize this resource because you're going to waste your time doing your know, free searches on the internet for trying to track down phone numbers of people. I mean, it's just you're going to come up with a lot of inaccurate, outdated numbers. This is a source that um, a lot of the debt collection debt collection agencies use and repo companies use to track down people that are in default. So it's very accurate. It's got access to uh, all the different cell phone providers, and uh, we found it to be absolutely incredible in our business. I love it. I love it. Now, my uh, tip of the week is going to be social analytics, right? So everyone keep hearing about, you know, marketing on Facebook, marketing on Twitter, Instagram, but how do you how do you know if it's being effective or not? You've got to have your analytics. Mm-hmm. So this site is called socialite.io. Uh socialite like a light, social and then l i g h t .io. It's in beta right now. But I think it's I don't I think it's free because um, I don't see any pricing on it and it's going to help you with your your campaigns your marketing campaigns and know if they're effective and get and get your analytics and um, and help you with the marketing. So there you go. Anyways, Kevin, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy busy schedule and uh, and share with us all your knowledge and your story with the Land Geek uh, podcast community. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me on the show, Mark. It's been been a lot of fun. Well, I, I hope you come back. 
hope you yeah. We'll talk. Any, any, anytime you invite me, you just have to invite me. I don't show up unannounced. All right, fantastic. <laughs> and uh, I'm, you know, I've been hazing Kevin to come to uh, Scottsdale for the two day Land Geek Boot Camp. And I'm going to remind everybody: look, book your calendars now. Contact the office, email us, and start getting ready for the two day all intensive Land Geek Boot Camp, November seventh and eighth. Duran's going to be there. I'm going to be there. Um, we're going to talk about all things land investing. We're going to network. There's going to be prizes. It's going to be great. And I hope you all can be there. I want to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedules as well to even listen to the podcast. And um, again, go to www.thelanegeek.com. Download for free the Passive Income Blueprint. Get the ebook, How to Avoid the Three Fatal Land Buying Mistakes. And of course, get this always informative and engaging podcast delivered each week to your email inbox. Kevin, thanks again. And uh, thanks, everybody. We'll see everyone next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.